Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Teen Kids News. I'm Reed. We've got a lot to tell you about, so let's get started. Here's our top story. Teens are often under a lot of pressure to do well in school. But that doesn't mean it's okay to copy someone else's hard work and pass it off as your own. Teachers call it plagiarizing. But as Benjamin reports, you can also call it cheating. And don't think you won't get caught. You've probably heard the word plagiarize, but what exactly does it mean? When you take somebody else's words or ideas and you use them as your own. That's exactly right. In fact, the word plagiarize comes from the Latin word for kidnap. Only instead of stealing a person, modern plagiarizing means stealing someone else's work. Now, most of us won't copy another person's work exactly. We know that's cheating. But what if we rearrange things a little? Everything is changed around just slightly, just so you can call it your own piece of work. Everybody doesn't. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but happens. It depends how much you change the words around. If you change the words around a lot and it really sounds different, then it's not. Sorry, rearranging the words does not get you off the hook. Unless you're stating something commonly known, a historical or scientific fact, if the information and ideas are not your own, you need to cite the source. To cite or make a citation is to state where the idea came from. It's certainly okay to get information from books or download information from the internet and change, put, the, put that wording into your own words, but you still need to cite it. So a quoting and rephrasing both need to be cited in the same way. Plagiarism is a growing problem. It's reported that more than half of all high school students have plagiarized at least once. Educators blame the internet. So much information is available online that it's where many of us turn first whether we're working on seventh grade homework or a senior project. I use the internet to do class research all the time. I use it to look up stuff if it's not in the textbook. Because it's more convenient than books and you don't have to go through a process of a library. The experts tell us online research is fine, so long as you cite the source of the information, just as you would if you took it from a book. Keep notes as you go along, and don't fall into the cut and paste trap, thinking you'll go back and find the sources later. Because if you forget to cite your internet source, that could look like plagiarism. So take your time and keep track of where you're getting your information from. I think in terms of what uh, middle schoolers should do, especially, is get into good study habits and not rush things or get things uh, going there at the last minute. Keep in mind that teachers use the internet as well. Therefore, it's pretty easy for them to catch plagiarism whether the student did it on purpose or just by mistake. So be wise, don't plagiarize. For Teen Kids News, I'm Benjamin. We still have a lot more to tell you about. Teen Kids News will be right back. In this episode of A Bit of Belgium, Emily tells us how a nobleman during the Middle Ages used a form of advertising to prevent rebellions. <laughs> Every day we see ads, online, on TV, on the side of the road, and even on clothing. Advertising is the art of getting across a message. And this man, Count Philip, had a message he wanted to get across to the people of Ghent. Back in the 12th century, Ghent was quite prosperous. International trade was making the town's merchants rich. To show off their wealth, they built tall houses made of expensive stone. That angered Count Philip. So he built a castle, bigger and higher than any of the merchants' houses. It was the Count's way of advertising just who counts the most in Ghent. But the Grimm Castle served a second purpose, to intimidate the people so that they would be afraid to rebel. Partially surrounded by a wide moat, it had high, thick walls. Walkways along the parapets enabled soldiers to fire arrows or throw heavy rocks on attackers below. Looking through the rectangular openings called embrasures, you can see that the Count was true to his word. The castle towers over the town. 
The strongest part was the building in the center, called the Castle Keep. Guess you could say the keep was built to keep the Count safe. Inside are dark winding staircases and drafty rooms. Speaking of drafty, imagine having to use this bathroom in the winter. A major advance in living conditions is explained in this room. It used to be that to keep warm, a fire was built in the center of a room. A big opening in the ceiling was needed to let out the smoke. Unfortunately, it also let in cold air and rain. The invention of the chimney changed that. Smoke can now be vented, not through an open hole, but through the chimney. This rather small room is where the Countess lived. And right next door is the much larger bedroom for the Count. Hanging on the wall, what every well-dressed warrior needs, a protective suit of chainmail. On display in this room are some of the many kinds of weapons the soldiers used. This sword is actually taller than the girls. The man who wielded it must have been a giant. Because armor was still in use, weapons needed to be powerful enough to penetrate metal. Before they had guns, they had crossbows. But the strings had to be so strong they could only be pulled back with a crank. This is where those accused of a crime would wait to hear their punishment. And those punishments were cruel. Executions took place here in the courtyard. Of course, before being punished, you had to be proven guilty. And they had a terrible way of doing that. Chains attached to a spike collar forced the accused to sit very still. After being interrogated this way for hours, sometimes days, the person almost always admitted to the crime, even if he or she was innocent. That's why the signers of our Constitution made sure there was an important addition to the Bill of Rights, the Eighth Amendment. It protects people from cruel punishments. With a bit of Belgium, I'm Emily for Teen Kids News. We've got to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more Teen Kids News. As we've been reporting over the past weeks, some very lucky and talented design students got a rather special opportunity to show off their creativity. New York City is a major center for jobs in the design field. Uh, we employ tons of folks that are doing magazine design, uh, design of furniture, design of interiors, design of buildings, and of course, fashion, fashion design. So if you want to study design, you've come to the right place. More than 900 fashion companies call New York City home and few streets in America have more famous names in fashion than Madison Avenue. So what better location can there be for students to exhibit their work? Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a design major at the School of Visual Arts. Sam is one of 21 students given the assignment to fashion a dress in whatever art style they liked. It could be Bauhaus, pop art, or any of the hundreds of other art movements. While some decided to push the envelope and make dresses out of strange materials like bubble wrap and even concrete, Sam chose to make his dress in the somewhat related style of textile art, but with a twist. Textile art is art based on fabrics and it's been around for basically all of history. But my dress in particular is a Persian rug that I turned into a form-fitting dress. It starts off with this lampshade as a hat that has this really long fringe that I got from the garment district. And I have this wonderful sash around the waist of the dress and a purse that's pinned to it, although it has fallen apart in the display case. The white part is not supposed to be seen, 
but I think it definitely adds to the beat. The fringe is really what made me excited about this project because dresses have fringe, rugs have tassels, so I wanted to combine the two. And then I made these, these conceptual shoes out of vintage vacuums that have rugs around them, and I coiled up the vacuum to actually be the heel of the shoe itself. The hardest part of creating my dress was finding everything. I ended up having to go on Facebook Marketplace and running around Manhattan. So, how does it feel to see your work displayed on Madison Avenue? It is an incredible honor because I love seeing people walking by and interacting with my piece. I love the, the tassels and the fringe. It's, they're just great. Teens should study design because it's fun. I love doing it. And that's one of the secrets to life, making a career out of something you love, whether it's fashion or not. For Teen Kids News, I'm Katerina. They say that safe driving is no accident. You have to work at being safe. To help with that, here's another short video from the National Road Safety Foundation. I'm excited to show you the sights here in Washington. Cool, I'm learning about them in school. Look, there's the US Capitol. Auntie, what's that? The Lincoln Memorial. And of course, that's the... Look out! <gasps> Don't miss the other cool videos created by the NRSF. It's easy to find more. Simply like, follow, and subscribe to the National Road Safety Foundation. We'll be right back with more Teen Kids news right after this. It's time for this week's Flag Facts. Here's Eric. Oregon's state flag pays tribute to its bountiful landscape and early settlers. In Oregon, you have the only flag to include two different images on the front side and the reverse side. You have a beaver on the reverse side, then on the front you have the Conestaga wagon for the pioneers. Other images in the heart-shaped center are a sunset, a mountain peak, a forest, a plow, sheaves of wheat, and a pickaxe. The 33 stars represent Oregon's place as our 33rd state. But the most interesting elements may be the two ships at sea. One is a British warship sailing away from shore, while the other is an American merchant ship arriving. They symbolize the transfer of power from British rule to American independence. Above it all, the American eagle protectively spreads its wings. And as Randy said, Oregon's state animal, the beaver, gets one whole side of the flag to itself. No other American animal can make that claim. With Flag Facts, I'm Eric. We'll have more Teen Kids news right after this. It's older than written history, and very probably was discovered by accident. Without it, our hamburgers and pizzas just wouldn't be the same. And what else could Mac possibly go with? Yes, we're talking cheese. Ever wonder how it's made? Well, wonder no more. Isla has the answer. Colorado claims the honor of holding the first rodeo, having the world's highest bridge, and the nation's longest continuous street. Its most famous mountain, Pikes Peak, is said to be the inspiration for the song, America the Beautiful, including the line, Purple Mountain Majesties. Colorado is also home to the Briar Gate Farm. It's in Longmont, just outside the city of Boulder. Briar Gate's not your typical farm. It's a goat farm. It's owned by Kate Johnson, who's not your typical farmer. When it comes to goat cheese, she's our goat two person. She runs a cheese-making school called The Art of Cheese. Hi, Kate. Or should I say howdy? <laughs> Either's fine. Hello. <laughs> and you're joined by an assistant? Yes, this is my 16-year-old assistant, Shade. Hi, Shade. Hi. I've heard cheese described as carefully rotted milk. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, one description is it's curdled milk. It's just we're going to do it on purpose instead of waiting for it to do it accidentally. So what's the first step to doing it on purpose? Well, we're going to make goat cheese, which is chev or chevre. 
And this is a 24 hour cheese. So I have it in all different stages, but our first step is just to heat the milk. Pretty simple. We're just gonna warm it up to about room temperature. That's all there is to it. Then we're gonna add some culture. And culture is just a good bacteria that we put into the milk to acidify the milk. So that's a big word, but it just means we're gonna make this change its pH level and become more acidic because the culture will convert the lactose in the milk to lactic acid. Once the milk is affected by the culture, you add an enzyme called rennet. What is that exactly? Great, so I've already cultured this milk and I actually already enzymed it, but after I add the culture, I'm gonna add the enzyme, which is going to coagulate the milk. What that means, it's gonna take all those solids in the milk and pull them together so that it's no longer liquid, it's a solid. So that's the enzyme's job. And do you typically need to wait 12 hours before the next step? That's right. So I started this about 12 hours ago because otherwise you'd have nothing to see. And when I get to 12 hours, I have a curd. So whoops, I poured some of the whey out. But there's curd, that's the solid parts of the milk. And then there's whey, that's the liquid part of the milk. And it just did that while I was sleeping or while I was off working. It does it all by itself once you've added those ingredients. And then after the 12 hours, what do you do next? Well, this is where Shade's going to come in because she's going to do this. I'm going to show her and explain to you what we're doing. But we're just going to take this little skimmer spoon and we're going to take thin little slices of this curd. Right now, this is more like yogurt than it is cheese. And so we're going to scoop it into some cheesecloth. So I'm going to have Shade do that part for you and we'll switch places. Now, Kate, while Shade is doing that, when showing us what was in the pot, you mentioned you spilled some whey. What exactly is whey? Yeah, so when we make cheese, we're going to end up with curds, that's the cheese, that's the solids in the milk, and whey, that's the liquid that's left over from making cheese. So you have curds and whey. So that was what Little Miss Muffet was eating while sitting on her tuffet. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay, so after putting the curd on the cheesecloth, what's the next step? Okay, so then the next step is we have to let this drain. And so to let it drain, we're going to turn this square piece of cheesecloth into a bag. And so we're going to do that by tying opposite corners together. So I'll tie the first ones, and then Shade will tie the next ones, and then hold it up, and you'll see we've created a bag of cheese. In fact, these cheeses are often referred to as bag cheeses. And now you can see it's dripping the whey, right? So it has to drip now or drain because there's too much liquid in this cheese. Remember, it's more like yogurt now and we want it to be more solid. So we're gonna just let that drain and that's where I have this next pot. We're gonna just tie it onto the handle here so that it can drip into the pot and that way I'm catching the whey because I might want to save that whey and use it for cooking or baking or putting it in smoothies. It has a lot of protein in it, but it needs to drain for a little while. And then after about another 12 hours, that little bag will look like this. And this is our finished cheese, but we have one more step. So I'm going to have Shade hold that. We need to add a little bit of salt, okay? So we're gonna open up that bag and we're going to add a little bit of salt. And I just have here some non-iodized sea salt. Doesn't have to be any kind of fancy salt, but we want it to be non-iodized because it'll taste better and um, it'll dissolve a little bit better. Is salt only to add taste? No, the salt actually holds several functions. It's to add taste, but it's also a preservative and in some cheeses, it's also helping to remove even more whey because the difference between a really soft, creamy cheese and a harder cheese in a lot of cases is how much whey did you remove from the curd. So I'm going to have Shade just sprinkle like about a quarter of a teaspoon on there. Not a lot. Just sprinkle it over the top. And then I like to use a fork to mix that salt into the curd. So I have a fork sitting over there and we'll just mix it right in there. And then our cheese is done. So really, most of the time, this cheese is making itself. We don't have to do very much. That's pretty cool. Shade, is cheese making a hobby or do you want to make it your career? 
No, it is just a hobby, but it is a very fun thing to do, especially if you have, have a lot of spare time. And what's the most challenging part of the process? For me, I definitely struggle with making the cheese curdle properly. Um, so definitely getting the nice, good, solid curd is really rewarding when it happens. Well, I love cheese. I wish I could taste it. Thank you both. I now have a much greater respect for cheese. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you're welcome. In researching this story, we discovered that Colorado claims to be where the cheeseburger was invented. But California and Kentucky also claim to have given birth to the burger topped with cheese. Guess I'll just have to chew on that for a while. For Teen Kids News, I'm Isla. That's it for this edition of Teen Kids News. Thanks for watching. See you again next week.